My name is John Kerr. I'm the president of the board of the Battle of Homestead Foundation. We're very pleased to have you all here today. Uh, today's the culmination of our program series for 1919, and uh, it, it, will, it will be one of, of, of really many, I think, compelling programs that we've conducted this year. Um, I, I want to point out that today we are meeting in the only remaining kind of functional building uh, that exists of the Battle of Homestead, in fact, was the site uh, by the river of the, uh, the, the Battle of Homestead in uh, July 6, 1892, where um, the Pinkerton uh, detectives who were attempting to guard the mill and introduce scabs uh, to break a strike that had happened because of a lockout, <laughs> um, uh, where they were repelled by a whole town's people and workforce and everyone. Uh, and uh, it, uh, we, for a time we had a workers republic here in Homestead uh, until the governor called in uh, 7,000 entire state militia to occupy the town, 7,000 people and to uh, permit, permit the, uh, the scabs to, to uh, come into the mill. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, the mayor of Homestead, uh, Betty Esper. Betty, former state worker. Uh, and, and especially uh, to welcome a contingent from Oberlin College that are here. The, uh, And uh, now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jackie Cavalier, who is our, our, our uh, programs uh, coordinator for all of our Battle of Homestead programs this year, who's going to make a few comments. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming today. Um, I have in my hand a pamphlet that included uh, and includes all of our programs that we offered. Um, this year, our theme, as you can see, was 1919 Bridges from History. And we began our programming on April 25th with our kickoff lecture here at the Pump House. We've had a commemoration of the assassination of Fanny Sellins this year. We've had a film series and discussion on family separation at the border. We had a discussion on labor and the environment, the challenges uh, faced. Certainly we've had a celebratory event that was labor um, and protest and song. And um, we've had a number of other events, including films, discussions, um, tours, you name it. So if you're new to the Battle of Homestead, we strongly, strongly encourage you to please sign up, uh, become a member, check out our website, and while this program, this awesome, awesome program that we are here today um, to uh, um, hear and engage and participate in, while this is the last of our uh, programs for this calendar year, we, again, really invite you to become active in this organization because there's a lot of people who are doing really valuable and wonderful things, and we would love for you to be a part of it. So with that said, I am so proud and so happy to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Steffi Domeik is one of the founding members of the Battle of Homestead Foundation. She is a tireless labor activist, filmmaker, um, and she will be uh, here facilitating our discussion today. Former steel worker. And former steel worker. We, we often talk, focus here on labor issues, and so it's not, and, and community issues, but um, religious intolerance and, and the kind of hate that we're experiencing now, I'm not saying it's a new topic for us, but it's certainly a, a really difficult one, uh, particularly for all of us from the community. When we organized this panel, we had uh, hoped uh, also to have uh, Tammy Hepps up here with us. Um, and she's, she's busy because she's an activist and they have an action today. And so I just want to uh, introduce Tammy and uh, sort of wish her the best today with the action and we hope that she will 
be back with us uh, and talk with us in the future. Tammy is a local historian who we met with the Battle of Homestead um, after we had done a lot of commemoration on uh, the Battle of Homestead. We didn't know a lot about the Jewish community. I'm one of the folks that put together the book, The River Ran Red, and the film, and there wasn't much on the Jewish community. It, it was nothing, I mean, frankly. And so when Tammy came to our group afterwards doing research on her own family history, and she's really a local, become a local historian, um, of some note, and we really uh, look forward to hearing from her again. She did a presentation with us a couple years back. Um, also with us uh, is uh, Carl Redwood. Um, Carl Redwood is also a former steelworker like myself for uh, U.S. Steel back in the t in the day, as we say, <laughs> the 70s and 80s, and uh, was very active at that time, as was I in that. Uh, unemployment work and uh, became a social worker and he's been involved in a lot of uh, important work in the Hill District around, um, around uh, housing <coughs> and uh, he's also been with the University of Pittsburgh uh, as a faculty member for a number of years. Then Joe White is also uh, going to speak. He's been active in the civil rights uh, and anti-war movement for over half a century. I've known Joe for, 50, for half a century. Um, he's taught uh, social movements uh, of our times at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've been studying a book by John Cox, who directs the Center for Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights at the University of North Carolina. Yeah, he wrote a book titled To Kill a People, Genocide in the 20th Century. So many of the key ideas I will share today come from some of his writings. One of his articles is titled Racism, Xenophobia, Anti-Semitism, A Lethal Mix. The article had me thinking back 40 years ago. I was here in Pittsburgh and a member of a small group called the Communist Workers Party. We were preparing for a march and rally against the Klan in Greensboro, North Carolina on November 3rd, 1979. On November 3rd, 1979, white supremacist terrorists ambushed a group of anti-racist demonstrators, shooting and killing five of them. Like the other perpetrators, Glenn Miller, a longtime notorious Klan organizer, never spent a day in jail. 35 years later, Glenn Miller walked into a Jewish community center and retirement home in Overland Park, Kansas, and killed three people. Like the victims of last year's massacre in Pittsburgh, they were all elderly. No matter to radical anti-Semites, quote, all Jews must die as Robert Bowers declared. The imaginations of such people that, that Jews not only control the world, but they also abet the decline of the white race through race mixing, or these days by funding invasions of immigrants and refugees. The morning of his October 27th attack on the Tree of Life, Robert Bowers posted on a far-right website, HIAS likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered, unquote. Earlier in October, he had posted, why hello there, HIAS. You like to bring in hostile invaders to dwell among us? HIAS, originally named the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, is one of the country's most valuable and effective immigrant and refugee support organizations. The people killed on Saturday, this is an article from last year, the people killed on Saturday were killed for trying to make the world a better place as their faith exhorts them to do, wrote Adam Server in The Atlantic the next day. The, the history of the Jewish people is one of displacement, statelessness, and persecution. What groups like HIAS do in helping refugees, they do with the knowledge that comes from a history of being the targets of demagogues who persecute minorities in pursuit of power. In an article titled, The Pittsburgh Massacre Was About Refugees, Mark Silk wrote, yes, Robert Bowers, the alleged killer, 
seems to be a classic anti-Semite, seeing a malignant Jewish conspiracy behind everything he doesn't like. But the evidence indicates that it, it was Jewish support for migrants that caused him to take up guns. He had been railing on the social media against HIS, the Jewish agency that works on behalf of refugees of all kinds. He specifically mentioned HIS, National Refu Refugee Sabbat, which synagogues across the country celebrated a week before the massacre. In fact, no one should be surprised that a large segment of the Jewish community stood up to oppose the Trump administration's policy of separating children from parents at the southern border. Quote, as Jews, we know what it is like to leave one's country of origin in search of peace and freedom from oppression, declared a statement from the Jewish Federation of Greater Hartford last June. Our Torah reminds us again and again that we should not wrong or oppress a stranger because we too were once strangers in a new land. The statement concluded, we stand with dozens of national organizations from across the spectrum of Jewish tradition in condemning this immoral policy and demanding that the administration rescind it. This was not the first or last time that white supremacists target Jews for their solidarity with other oppressed people. A quote, on the morning of Sunday, October 12, 1958, shortly after 3.30 a.m., an explosion ripped through the Reformed Temple on Peachtree Street in Atlanta. Although no one was hurt, the blast which woke people from their sleep several blocks away caused almost $200,000 in damage. Within 15 minutes of the blast, staff at the UPI received a call from an individual identifying himself as, quote, General Gordon of the Confederate Underground. He said, we bombed a temple in Atlanta. This is the last empty building we will bomb. Negroes and Jews are hereby declared aliens. The bombing of the Reformed Temple was the culmination of an orchestrated terrorist campaign against Southern Jews. Since the colonial era, Jews and Gentiles had lived in relatively peaceful coexistence in the South. Latent prejudice towards Jews nonetheless surfaced in times of social and economic upheaval, such as the Civil War, the agricultural depression of the late 19th century, and the transition from a rural to an urban industrialized economy. In each of these instances, Jews were blamed for the problems that beset the Southern people. As Webb said in his article, anti-Semitism, racism, and xenophobia has surfaced in times of social and economic upheaval. Today, there has been a rise of the right-wing populist movements that fuel and grow this hatred. Right-wing populists and nationalist governments are in power in Russia, Turkey, India, Israel, Hungary, Poland, Britain, and the United States. They share power with left-wing populists in Italy. Um, and they've established right-wing parties in Canada. Australia are busy, busy adapting to the populist trend. Japan uh, has, has taken its conservative liberal par party in a notably nationalist direction. It's enough to make one want to dust off one's Hegel and explain the rise of the populist right as a kind of inedible antithesis moving through the world, a literal reaction to the post-Cold War thesis of liberal internationalism in foreign policy, progressivism in cultural politics, and globalism in finance. Or alternately, to dust off one's marks and look for common changes in material conditions that might drive people in so many different cultures to an acute anxiety about order. Accelerating urbanization, the collapse of village and family hierarchies, a global collapse in the power of labor relative to capital, and an acute distrust of the authorities that claim to maintain it. Because that is the common thread that runs through all of these diverse cultural and political environments. Anxiety about order traditionally pushes the public to embrace parties of the right who most credibly promise to restore order, whether we're talking about fighting crime or preserving a familiar culture. And anger at corruption and elite self-dealing quite naturally drive the public to punish established leadership 
and give newcomers a try, and to seek out newcomers who viscerally share their frustration. What is the commonality in contemporary conditions around the world that has made people in so many countries susceptible to both emotional impulses at once and powered the global rise of the populist right? This populist right is the soil within which this hatred uh, uh, develops and comes forward again and again. And it's not just here in the United States, it's all over the world. I'll now turn it over to my comrade Joe White. Anti-Semitism and racism are high and rising. We all know this. That's why we're here today. That's why we uh, need uh, some historic, some indeed a lot of historical uh, perspective in order to understand and fight it better. Anti-Semitism was, of course, inextricably wound up in the, form of the formation of the State of Israel itself. Put bluntly, had it not been for the Holocaust, there probably would not be the State of Israel today. Okay, I can get into all sorts of, uh, uh, of fancy uh, philosophy of history, uh, 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 yammering on this point, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, do that. Okay. Uh, we're instead uh, going to move directly to the uh, fact that the Holocaust did take uh, place, uh, that uh, the uh, so-called civilized nations of the world, with the exception of the United States, were bled white during the uh, war, and were therefore in no real position to prevent, starting with the British, were in no position to prevent the uh, uh, prevent armed struggle and terrorism, from uh, and terrorism in Palestine between the uh, end of 1945 and the declaration of the State of Israel in May of 1948. Okay. The timing couldn't have been better for the Zionists. The Arabs were politically and militarily weak and disunited. The so-called great powers were actually falling all over themselves to be the first to recognize uh, Israel. And indeed, it was uh, some smuggled arms from the Skoda work of, uh, of uh, Czechoslovakia, where the uh, communist uh, uh, coup uh, to take over, uh, had just taken place uh, that helped the uh, insur uh, uh, insurgents win in uh, uh, 1948 and for Israel to win its first of many wars. What about the Palestinians? They existed. Okay, there's much more we have to say about that, but again, in the interest of time, I've got to move on. The Palestinians had protested and rioted throughout the interwar between World Wars I and II period. David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, himself said that if he were a Palestinian, he would fight the uh, Zionist tooth and nail. Uh, the Israeli strategy around about 1948 was a mishmash of denial, ethnic cleansing, no moves whatsoever toward a peace and border settlement, and unsurprisingly for people in their position, the uh, writing of a new constitution. Okay, uh, okay. constitutional history is uh, diff invariably difficult and boring, so we're gonna move uh, fast. Uh, every schoolboy knows that Israel is the only uh, democracy in the Mideast, right? Well, not quite so fast. Okay, let us compare uh, for a moment one uh, the uh, Constitution of 1787 of our country and the Israeli uh, Constitution of uh, uh, 1948. Okay, what, what, what does our Constitution say about religion in American life? Okay, I'm, I'm being professorial here on purpose. Go on, right. help, help me on this. What does the Constitution say about religion and? Hey, no, okay, no established church in this country. Eric is not a Christian, uh, a Christian country. End of discussion. The Israeli constitution uh, lay, uh, lays it down categorically that Israel is a Jewish state. Not a secular state, not a secular binational state. Think Canada here for a moment. Nothing of the, uh, of the sort. Israel is a Jewish uh, a, a state, established religion. Okay, uh, okay. Which should, uh, for those of you, which should remind us that there are actually two kinds of modern nationalism: civic nationalism, kind of what our constitution says, and ethnic nationalism. 
what the uh, Israeli Constitution. Uh, Joe, it's it's not Israel constitution. does not have a constitution. You're talking about not the Constitution. They have a series of basic laws which have set up their, their established stru legal structure. Okay, I, I take your point. I mean, uh, uh, a point. Uh, Britain doesn't have a written constitution either, but uh, but they didn't have a basic. Okay, point uh, po uh, point made. Okay, uh, in any of but in any event, uh, the, uh, Israel has doubled down on their politics being an uh, uh, an ethnic uh, one. So much so that uh, that unless you take the trouble to learn about this stuff, you will not know that one out of every five resident and voters uh, in uh, Israel are not Jewish. They're not, uh, uh, are not Jewish. Uh, okay. Uh, Israel's trade union federation does not allow non-Jewish members. Some of the significant, not to say the finding aspects of Israel's history since uh, 1948, uh, consists first of wars, 1948, 1956, 1967, 19. Uh, 73, and constant low-level war thereafter. A large army, nuclear weapons. Okay. Uh, the only country uh, uh, that I'm aware of that has nuclear weapons but doesn't admit to having them, an anomalous uh, state of affairs, to put it mildly. Uh, okay. Policies that are clear in clear violation of international law. Uh, at least one major political party that we could uh, 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 whose leaders, uh, starting with Menachem Begin, uh, believe that uh, Israel ought to extend from the Nile to the Euphrates, from the Nile to the Euphrates. Okay, get, get your map out, get your Google map out, and you can figure out for yourself what that entails. All right, here are some of the takeaways uh, that we have to do. Okay, Israel is today hated and feared by many millions of people all over the world. Okay. This is a cold hard fact. Hated you know, for Jewish people. Well, for any people to be hated and feared for many millions of people all over the world is a misfortune, uh, which we Americans ought to know a thing into about as uh, well. Okay. By most criteria, Israel to date has not provided a safe haven for the Jewish people, has certainly not solved the so-called Jewish question. Uh, okay, uh, uh, which uh, Zionists, don't forget, think exists in uh, much the same way as Gentiles who insist on the reality of something called the Jewish question. Critics of Israel have been called anti-Semites. American critics of the Vietnam War were called uh, traitors and worse. Is this a false dichotomy? I'm afraid not. I'm afraid that I'm afraid that we are looking squarely at a uh, situation of if the shoe fits, wear it. Okay, here's why I think so. Okay, the people who are called anti-Semites today differ fundamentally in what they are saying from 2,000 years of anti-Semitism in the following key respects: is the uh, refusal of the Jewish people to recognize uh, Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah, uh, 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 what drives today's anti-Semitism, or so would uh, those who are said to have, be anti-Semites? The answer is no. Okay, murderers of Christ? No, that's not the issue. Absolute refusal uh, to uh, accept the plain meaning of scripture, which after all, for those of you who are into uh, religion, was uh, Martin Luther's uh, gripe against the Jewish people. No, that's not the issue. One great big conspiracy, which is after all what the uh, Chronicles of the Elders of Zion is all about, okay, it's the oldest and most durable uh, uh, conspiracy uh, theory that, uh, uh, that I know of. So, no, no, not one great big uh, conspiracy. It's an open book. Uh, okay, now, this is not to deny for a moment the ugliness uh, uh, and uh, viciousness and coarseness of the anti-Semitic rants. Gotcha, thank you, uh, Stephanie, uh, uh, out there on the uh, uh, internet. Okay, nor is it uh, to deny that, uh, uh, that luminaries of the uh, European Enlightenment in the 18th century, Voltaire and uh, Diderot, uh, 
uh, were, uh, uh, didn't think much of the uh, Jews. They didn't think much of Christianity. Of course, they didn't think much of the uh, uh, Jews either. Uh, it's yesterday's intellectual history news. Okay, and then there's the problem of Spinoza and Marx and Sigmund Freud and uh, Rosa Luxemburg and people like that. Are all of them anti-Semites? Closer to home and to our own literary taste and as Americans in the no, 20th century, uh, Philip Roth. The late Philip Roth. Was Philip Roth an anti-Semite? Think about it. Okay, time is uh, fleeing and I gotta go. Uh, uh, go. Ra uh, uh, racism in the, uh, 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 racist oppression and slavery in the ancient world. It existed, it existed, I, uh, Okay, everybody knows that the uh, uh, Romans divided humankind into Romans and barbarians. Everybody knows uh, that Athenian democracy was a uh, white man's Athenian democracy based on uh, uh, slavery. Uh, recent research on uh, slavery in the ancient world has uh, uh, brought out the fact that uh, slave owners were obsessed over runaways, uh, that organized protest struggle did exist. Uh, the Marxist, uh, 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 sometimes have a problem of this one. Uh, we also know that punishment in, uh, in the ancient world of uh, uh, slaves uh, uh, could often be cruel and uh, deadly. And uh, modern research has uh, shown that slaves had a little shorter life expectancy uh, than everybody uh, 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 else, which is uh, really very uh, uh, telling. Okay, uh, so much, uh, okay, uh, so much uh, so that the only saving grace of, uh, of ancient uh, uh, slavery and uh, oppression uh, was that manumission and citizenship were not unheard of and that uh, for the most part uh, the Roman law did not accept uh, things like the Dred Scott, uh, Scott decision which is uh, said in no uncertain terms that there uh, uh, that, uh, that co white men's courts have no uh, uh, that black folks have no rights that the uh, white man is bound to respect pure and uh, 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 pure and simple. Okay, so that, uh, okay, so that to uh, make a very long uh, a story uh, since 1619 uh, short, the only thing wrong with radical reconstruction in the 19th century is that it didn't uh, last for another 25 years. Okay, uh, uh, why it did not uh, is uh, again something that we need to think and learn more uh, uh, about. Um, okay, but uh, uh, no said on uh, that. Uh, modern racism, to my taste anyway, this uh, uh, the pat uh, pattern of, of uh, scientism about it, okay, that there's a scientific uh, racism, is uh, something again that, uh, oh, that oppression and uh, slavery in the ancient world just did not recognize, uh, but is, uh, 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 means that in a sense uh, the kind of racism that we uh, uh, come to know and love uh, is in this one respect even worse. Okay, uh, uh, finally, uh, what, about the, uh, what about the future? What is to, uh, uh, to be done? First, uh, we are all agreed, I hope, that things will not get better by themselves. Okay, and certainly not globalized because of glo uh, globalized capitalism. It's not the way things work. Okay, okay. even in the enlightened year, of, well, where the hell are we, 2019? Have you ever heard a white Democratic Party politician even the best of them, a campaign on the platform. If a policy is good for black folks, it's also good for white folks. Okay, okay, that's the okay. That's the terrible news. But which we all, but people of color are the majority of men of humankind. They are their own best championships. That is not going to uh, change. Okay, because it isn't the slogan, as Carl has already explained, uh, an injury to one is an injury to all is as valid and timely as ever. The struggle continues. Thank you. And I'm going to read again from an article from last year, a little bit after this time, that was actually directed towards philanthropy and funders. Um, and it said, one aspect, it says, funders need smarter strategies for combating hate. And this is from last year. It says, last month our communities came under physical attack again. The president sent more than 5,000 troops 
threatening state-sponsored violence against a caravan of Central American refugees seeking political asylum. Two black senior citizens, Maurice Stallard and Vicki Jones, were murdered in cold blood in a grocery store in Kentucky. A shooter screaming, all Jews must die, killed 11 elderly Jewish congregants at a synagogue in Pittsburgh. The men who perpetrated this violence are very clear on the connection between these acts. The question progressive movements and funders need to ask ourselves moving forward is, are we? White supremacists have a twisted worldview in which anti-Semitism forms the theoretical core of white nationalism. Mm -hmm. Racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism are not separate strands of hatred for these ethno-nationalists, but rather deeply intertwined and mutually reinforcing. So too must be our strategies in combating. Some in our communities have always understood that our safety lies in solidarity. Ancient rabbis in the Babylonian Talmud taught we sustain the non-Jewish poor with the Jewish poor, visit the non-Jewish sick with the Jewish sick, and bury the non-Jewish dead with the Jewish dead for the sake of peace. Thousands of years later, black civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hamer put it more succinctly, nobody's free until everybody's free. Our practice, however, too often fails to act on this communal knowledge. It is vanishingly rare to find a mention of anti-Semitism, much less a discussion of the intersection of it with anti-black racism and xenophobia in progressive philanthropic spaces. Anti-Semitism does not fit neatly into American narratives around oppression, and very little has been done by most people who would otherwise consider themselves social justice-minded activists or funders to understand it. Part of the complexity is the small gain towards attaining whiteness that the majority of the U.S. Jewish community has been able to make in the last few decades. The fact that the state-sponsored protection in the form of extra police was extended to Jewish synagogues and schools contrasts markedly with the response to attacks on black churches. Regardless of whether you believe police protection is useful or desirable, it bears noting that black churches were not offered it despite the historic and present trend of white supremacist violence where African Americans gather to worship. This kind of disparity perpetuates nominal divides between two communities that are facing threats connected at the root. So too do scandals that seek to obfuscate the difference between the real violent threat of white supremacists compared to the ignorance reflected in anti-Semitic and anti-black comments that occasionally rears its ugly head in both communities. We do not believe that this happens by oversight or accident. Rather, these divisive tactics are expressly designed to strengthen white supremacy by distracting us from our shared values and goals and obscuring the clear and present danger represented by the white nationalist movement. Philanthropy has a role to play in navigating this dynamic. Don't use your power to re-entrench divisions. Instead, leverage your power to deepen your analysis and educate others about the connection between anti-Semitism and anti-black racism. Instead of excluding groups who are mostly values aligned, but may be ignorant about this connection, make space to wrestle with hard history towards joint action. It is our hope that with these terrible massacres, we are motivated to search our blind spots and expose them to the light. To learn through resources such as the Jews for Racial and Economic Justice Toolkit or the National Coalition Building Institute, to dialogue, and more than anything else, to act in ways that reflect a newfound understanding of what this moment in our history demands of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, Joe, uh, Carl. Um, very informative. And 
uh, you both touched on some issues that I, I, I just like to um, pursue a little bit. Uh, the, the idea, uh, you know, the, the rise of anti-Semitism all over the world, but particularly in this country, uh, is, uh, of course, we all agree is, is terrible and to be condemned. We, we don't really uh, understand exactly, or at least we haven't touched on exactly why that's happening, other than the rise of white nationalism. Uh, we didn't really get to why the rise of white nationalism is happening. Um, uh, although, Carl, you did talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the global capitalism that's alienating more and more people. And, um, causing the rise of scapegoats to uh, uh, take the blame, um, rather than looking in the, in the right directions for, for their miserable lives, uh, and the lack of education in our miserable education system, et cetera, et cetera. We all understand that, I think. Um, the nature of um, bringing together anti-Semitism with racism uh, uh, was a very, very good point that was made, and it's very important. And to um, uh, collectively bring together the people that are being oppressed by the same uh, white nationalist forces is crucial. Uh, Joe's comments about Israel and the Palestinians, uh, while he, uh, because of time, was forced to move quickly over a lot of the material, I would just like to, to focus on, on that for a second, and that is, while, we, while many of the Jewish organizations in America and in here in Pittsburgh and all over the world um, have, have uh, rightly uh, struggled to fight the anti-Semitism that surrounds us and that is attacking the Jewish community. Um, and as even, and, and I, 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 my knowledge is limited, but in terms of Pittsburgh, I know that the Jewish community has reached out to um, various refugee communities and it's been very helpful and very supportive. However, the, the line has been drawn when it comes to recognizing the oppression of the Palestinian people and the internal refugee situation within Israel and the occupied territories perpetrated by the Israeli uh, government and its people who have become, in my opinion, in the opinion of many, more and more racist as the years have gone by, more and more oppressive, more and more laws against non-Jews, and uh, a, a more strident attempt to um, get rid of the Palestinian people and take their land. So the, the question is, while we must support anybody's struggle to fight against anti-Semitism and racism, when the same people that are fighting that within our own community are unable to struggle against the racism against the Palestinian people, how do we reconcile that not only blatant contradiction, but a contradiction that results in tremendous violence against the people? Um, so what does that say about the genuineness of the struggle against anti-Semitism when it excludes an entire people that are being persecuted because they're not Jewish. So I'll leave it at that. ...between the one Jewish homeland in the world and all of the other countries of the world that engage in worse behavior, where they're not condemned. It doesn't make Israel right. But there are a lot of people Jews, Muslims, Christians inside that country that want to work together, that are working together, and eventually will turn this thing around. My problem is the constant condemnation of Israel. I condemn Israel when I feel it's important, but to universally say Israel is the jewel among the nations, which is what's being preached 
and what I heard here today, I consider to be out of line. In terms of racism, racism is just with the African American community, but it's particularly with the African American community. The Jewish community in Pittsburgh has reached out to the African American community in significant ways and continues to do so now, developing common programs. We reach out to other communities. The Latino community on Wednesday night is also an event that we'll be attending. We would like to reach out to you. I never heard of this group, so I apologize for not reaching out to you guys previously. But understand that we intend to be good citizens wherever we are, including in our homeland of the state of Israel. This is our national homeland, the United States. Our spiritual homeland, the place that we look to for spirituality, is Jerusalem and Israel, and it's been that way for 2,000 years since you were thrown out and slaughtered by the Romans, and then not just thrown out of places for 2,000 years, but slaughtered for 2,000 years. This was not the first Holocaust in World War II. There were many, many, many Holocausts before then. So what do we need to do? We need to work together, guys. We need to bring it all together. We need to stop hating. We need to stop looking at the other as the other recognize the commonality of our humanity. And we should do it right now. Next week is a great time to start. Actually, right now is a great time to start. I'm concerned that the discussion here is operating more on the global level than I think we need to do here in Pittsburgh. Um, it's important. The global discussion is important. But what we really need to do also is talk about ways in which we here in Pittsburgh, uh, either individually or in groups, can fight this scourge. There's a lot of discussions about, there's a lot of opinions about why it's there. My personal opinion is it's social media, but you know, I'm always been against computers anyway. Um, but uh, the other cause, of course, being um, the economics uh, of people's lives and how tenants lash out to people that are different from them. So I'd like to have some conversations about how we can, uh, how in Pittsburgh we can come together to fight. There's plenty of it in Pittsburgh and there's plenty of it in the United States and I think we need to, to focus on that some. I know when, in my home, and I live in the South Hills in Bethel Park, I put a sign in my yard about Black Lives Ladder, Matter and immigrants are welcome here. And it was an American flag sign. It had all the things. And all my neighbors got really riled up about it because I put this sign in my yard. And I said, well, what line don't you agree with? <laughs> well, they couldn't say. But the fact that I was assumed because I was white that I thought like them really, really alarmed me. I thought, wow, okay. Now what can I do with that? And what I can do with that is go along, let them think I'm a duck just like they are, let them express what they need to express, and then challenge them on it. Challenge the thinking. Because the assumption was, and we've lived there for 20 years, that we thought like them, we agreed with them, all their values we shared. And it wasn't until I started putting signs in my yard that they realized that I wasn't like them. And so I, I want to take that opportunity to um, use the, the position of power that we have amongst our own ethnic culture to change the values within that culture, to challenge that in ways that minorities, for whatever reason, can't challenge. We have a power to us. Being white, it's assumed we have this power. Use it to undo what has been done for centuries. Demonstrate the love, demonstrate, but you must 
call it out when you see it. And you can do it in a non-adversarial way so that you can educate and help people to see. Because, you know, all this is fear-based, you know. Everything is fear-based. The fear of, oh, I'm going to lose my job. You're going to blame a minority because you're going to lose a job when it's, you know, artificial intelligence that's taken it over or whatever the, whatever the reason is. We always need scapegoats. We're always looking for scapegoats. We have to undo that scapegoat. And to undo the scapegoat, you have to be supportive of that person and get, get to the, the, the origin of that, which is the fear. And when you get to the origin of the fear and you, and, and you reduce the fear, they're able to take a step in the right direction, a step towards the other. Just said, um, as individuals, we have to step, step to it. You know, we can't just let it slide. And even though we're talking about and calling out white nationalism, there's also intolerance in the black community, intolerance in all of our communities, intolerance in our families, because that's what it comes down to. We, have, we probably have people in our family who, if we're positive thinking, progressive thinking people, we probably have people in our family who we think are just kind of weird or off. But we have to challenge that when it comes out as hatred and racism and bigotry. We have to challenge it whenever we see it, and that's very important. And it's in all communities, not just in the white community, although that's important. Uh, but intolerance and hatred sometimes comes from ignorance. There's a lot of ignorance that people have they don't know, or they learned incorrectly, or they believe incorrectly. Sometimes you can change that. It's that you don't always stay ignorant of things. You learn more, you can grow, and you can change. Because really our struggle is about human development. We're human beings. And as human beings, given the societies we live in, capitalism and all the other stuff, we get stunted in our development. We can't really develop our whole selves because we have to struggle to survive, compete with other folks, we gotta go after profit, all these things that keep us from being able to really uh, be the people that we can be. But we have to look to the future to build a new future where all of us can get the tools we need to really combat ignorance, which means we have to have the, the real history needs to be taught to all of us so we learn from one another as we work together and move forward. Another thing is we have to fight this whole right-wing populism thing. It's out of control globally. So that means we have to organize. Like the Tea Party didn't just come all of a sudden. It grew over a, a number of decades of grooming young people to come into their own as the, the, the basis of this right-wing populist thing. We used to think that generational progress is automatic. <clears throat> like each generation will get a little bit more human and a little bit more kind and a little bit more... No, that's not necessarily the case. It can flip all the way back if we're not really vigilant and don't stay on it. Each generation doesn't necessarily get better. And these big Holocaust kind of things that we've seen in the genocide around the world teaches us that it can flip all the way back. And we have to be very careful as we move forward. Um, but the generational progress thing is something we also have to work on. But, but I think we can move together, but we have to get more spaces like this where we work together, move together, and plan together. Because we don't necessarily have all the tools that we need to fight this hatred and intolerance right now. When you have government control, there's things that you can do. But we don't have government control in a lot of places around the world. And we don't have the capability to say, you know, that's just, that's not allowable. And these kinds of things can't happen. We, we, we profess it in our, our thinking sometimes and what we say, but we just don't have the right tools. And I'm not even sure what the tools are, but we have to create the kind of tools to teach people to really be human. Uh, people have said that I'm uh, uh, having a certain amount of difficulty of finding a handle here, but uh, one thing that for some reason came to my mind is uh, an old slogan from the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s in, uh, uh, in Europe uh, when 
uh, uh, when mass socialist uh, parties were uh, starting to be mass socialist parties and, uh, and uh, winning over millions and millions of people. So that even in Germany, uh, it, the leaders of the so, uh, social uh, uh, democrats uh, said, anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools. Okay, what a wonderful, you know, uh, uh, what, what a wonderful expression. That's true, of course. Yeah, of course, anti-Semitism is the socialism of, of fools. And in those uh, uh, optimistic and uh, naive uh, days, uh, just like Carl uh, uh, said, uh, people like ourselves thought that generation by generation uh, things uh, would, um, uh, would get, uh, get better, uh, except that they, uh, uh, except that they uh, uh, didn't, for the most part, but with certain exceptions. I mean, who was to know? Okay, who was to know that the Jewish community in Pittsburgh would uh, become more progressive over time? I certainly didn't uh, when I moved my good chattels and uh, little family uh, to uh, Pitt, uh, Pittsburgh in uh, 1968 to uh, take up a uh, teaching job at. Uh, at Pitt. Okay. Back then, the Pittsburgh Jewish community did not have a single rabbi who had come out against the uh, Vietnam War and uh, did not have a single uh, rabbi to, uh, uh, who would perform mixed marriages. Okay. Well, I found that pretty, uh, uh, pretty retrograde. And as a result, I uh, had nothing to uh, uh, do with the uh, Jewish community up to and including moving in Squirrel Hill. Okay, I mean, this was a, a serious, and yet, as uh, some of my great and good friends could, uh, 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 could tell you, when it came to their children's bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs or bas mitzvahs, uh, and invited uh, me up uh, to, uh, you know, to, uh, give, uh, uh, to give the blessings, uh, I'm still pretty, uh, pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good and pretty articulate and uh, uh, proud of it, as I'm uh, proud of my uh, gray-haired uh, Stalinist uh, mama, who uh, taught me Hey, a lot of things, uh, uh, some not so good. Stalin was a great man, don't believe everything you read in the New York Times. But other, uh, but taught me other things like, don't forget that that, uh, that because of that bastard, uh, uh, Hitler, you are, uh, you know, you, you are a Jew and, uh, and be proud of it. Okay, so, uh, you know, so, uh, so I guess for, uh, for me what this all uh, means that uh, unlike the good Marxist I used to be, and maybe still am, who knows, uh, uh, that there is an awful lot of more contingency in history than I used to uh, uh, think. And this makes things both more uh, challenging and more optimistic uh, for all of us as the struggle proceeds. Okay, well, Carl, you mentioned that in the philanthropic world, Yeah, just real quickly, I think the main thing is the discussion is happening in philanthropy, not necessarily that the solutions are all there, but one is we have to, we have to revisit history in such a way that we can understand the, the bigotry and hatred and the, the oppression and inequalities and see them very clearly for what they are and see how they're still, they're still with us today. So like the theft of the land from the native peoples, the slavery against African Americans here, are some of the things that we have to learn more about. And it's not being taught in the school still. Not like it should. So that's one thing that needs to happen. But I don't have the full answer, and I don't think they do either. But we have to, just like we're wrestling here, we got to wrestle with these questions as we, but the goal is human development. But I just want to relate that I heard uh, I heard a, 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 a very good historian about anti-Semitism on, on NPR, and she made a distinction uh, between anti-Semitism and anti-racism in general that I, I found somewhat helpful. Uh, it, it's a difference; it, it may not be a full distinction, but um, she pointed out that 
most of the people um, who had engaged in anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric and organization and beliefs uh, do it on the basis that um, the Jews are up here and they're 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 um, pulling the strings. They're pulling the strings of society and us and controlling it, just like the rhetoric that we read from Bowers. You know that these groups are bringing the immigrants in, and we're the victims. We're the victims of it. Now, generally, the racists uh, don't argue that that black people are are, are the uh, the victims of anything, and and the, the, it's 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 more of let me see if I can get this right. It's like the, the momentum for anti-racism is to sort of stay ahead of the situation of black people. And they're, they're the problem because they're taking our jobs and things like that, but not because they're controlling society. I don't think there was much, <laughs> there, there was never really much uh, uh, discussion about how black people control our society and so on. So it, 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 I think it emphasizes to us that our job is to, uh, in talking to uh, people that are expressing anti-Semitic anti and racist things, is to, to say, yes, we are all victims in certain ways of things, and to, and to try to parse that out about what is really oppressing us all. Uh, and, and let's talk about it, and let's try to understand how, how it works. And so that's important that we, we acknowledge to people that, yes, we are suffering, Think and, and 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 we need to and we need to do something about it together. Um, so that's it. <laughs> For some time, and then the parents of the white children suddenly forbid that their children to play with her. And I've seen this over and over again. And I I grew up in a mining town that was all white and filled with Southern and Eastern European immigrants. It breaks my heart today to say that this is one of the key places where the KKK actually inhibits and inhabits their thoughts and their minds, and they're probably Trump voters. I'm, I'm sure that they are. Um, I visit back there and I accept uh, when I meet my friends who know this, I, I feel very bad that these same people who were discriminated against by the coal company, by society, today can't see that in the 1920s the KKK was marching against them, the Catholics, the immigrants, the labor, and so forth. And not just in the South, but right here in Pennsylvania. And they can't see that. And I think one of the bad, big reasons that these things happen is that we're segregation in this country is so established. It is very hard to get beyond that so that so many people don't know people who are Jewish, don't know people who are of a different color. The, I mean, African Americans only compose 12%, is it, Carl, of the population? They, yeah, well, something like that. And we, they can't be everywhere. <laughs> and we can't all know everybody and all these things. And I keep thinking we need ways in which we can bring these people together. It would be wonderful if we could destroy segregation and have all these things. But there are some means like uh, perhaps that uh, can be done. But let me just mention the proposals of a few of the presidential candidates to have a national service requirement. Why couldn't we have a community service requirement at a lower age level that brings everybody of different races and different religions and so forth together to do something for the whole community so that they can get to know one another and fight some of these scapegoating things? I mean, it hurts my, my, my soul so much to have my uncle, who was a great man in many ways, not personally, who was as racist as could be, and because he felt his position as a white person, being that was superior, should be superior to all these other people. It's the old social Darwinist view that you just go down the level 
and you're better, and even if you don't have much and you're not well off in any way, you, know, you don't even deal with these people. When he was in World War II, my uncle, for example, was in the Philippines, and he had a girlfriend who was a Filipino. When he was much more, I, I knew him soon after that as a child, and he was far less racist, and he became more racist as the more he lived in the United States. And I also call upon the labor movement to have and initiate some of these things and really discuss about racism. And churches and synagogues and mosques and whoever else can get together at lower levels so that this tendency to scapegoat and promote white supremacy to allow it to just fester is, is very important. And there may be all, all kinds of practical solutions, I hope, to doing that. So I don't want to be talking in general terms about racism as this esoteric big thing. I want to think of practical ways we can get around some of that and do some things. Uh, I would love to be a part of that. I lived in, one other thing, I lived in Atlanta for 17 years, moved back to Pittsburgh. I live in the South Hills. I am so bored, with, and especially at first, with seeing nothing but white faces, because I've been in Atlanta and saw a lot of, of people of different color. And I think we need these experiences uh, because people who don't have it can assume the, the craziest things about the other. And I think we need to focus on the other to unite and call it the other so we can unite anti-Semitism, racism, anti-immigrant uh, kinds of, of things as well. Thank you. There is also a very long history that we can be proud of. So I recently did a book with a colleague of mine who is a, studies African American history. It's called The Ghetto and Global History. And one of the things that the book showed was that if we look at the fight against ghettoization of black people in the United States and also of Jews, and you look at the history of that, you find a kind of unity there of two groups of people who really fought against that. And it goes back to actually Hitler's policy of the Nazi ghettos which of course were preludes to mass murder. So the first thing that happened was Jews were herded together in very, very small areas, and then they were systematically murdered. Well, in the post-war period, black activists and Jewish activists, civil rights activists, got together and began calling those enclaves in the United States where black people were forced to live. They weren't allowed to move out of these areas as ghettos, and it became a way, I think, to challenge the American government and to say, we just fought in World War II. We just fought against fascism. We have the same policies here. And in fact, that fight, which was a kind of joint fight, was very, very effective in breaking a lot of that housing discrimination. Now, there's still a history that, you know, is yet to come, right? That fight's not over. But I think also by focusing um, purely on the things that are problematic or that divide us, we lose sight of a very exciting history that actually both Jews and blacks can claim, and moreover, can claim together. And tell us your name, Wendy Goldman. <laughs> My name is Wendy Goldman. <laughs> and the author of what book? Um, it's the author of The Ghetto in Global History, which I put together with my colleague, Joe Trotter. Thank you. <laughs> well, I really resonate with what you said about trying to help us understand more of the nuance and rootedness in history. Um, and so keep what I say in that context. Um, uh, Carl, uh, early on, it, you, you said that um, a, a real problem was a twisted worldview that, um, that unites a lot of these different groups. And I really, that is what I also believe, okay? Um, and you might call it a mindset or a certain, you know, worldview vision of life. Um, and later you said, uh, a problem, at least in intolerance in families and so forth, is rooted in ignorance. 
And I want to kind of play those off against each other and suggest that focusing on ignorance is a bit of a red herring and can be a problem because it, is, it suggests that the solution is just correct knowledge. And there's a lot of research that is showing that these twisted worldviews are a matter of emotional, um, moral psychology and values that we just acquire and breathe in from these distorted worldviews. So, and those, and, and those things, even prejudice, I mean, you know, prejudice is rooted in false assumptions, prejudgments about people, stereotypes, you know, that, um, and on the other hand, related to that moral psychology is our need as individuals for our identity to associate with groups, with communities that we can feel comfortable in, that we can feel secure in. And so we have to recognize the fact that we need to be parts of groups. And, and the problem is then when those group, when we put so much of our identity into one group, then we have groups set over against each other. Um, and it's very difficult because sometimes the only thing we have in common is our humanity. In all other ways, we're very different. So if we keep looking for that unity that unites us all, it can be, you know, a false trail. So my suggestion is in the future, uh, we, I would suggest we need to really concentrate on the different kinds of groups and, I, and how we, to what extent we find our identity in those groups. And then how we can learn to live together with our different groups' identity. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. To relate uh, the discussion uh, to uh, capitalism and the present phase of capitalism, of globalization and neoliberal capitalism. Uh, it, it, and I'll do it uh, through an example. The example of our loss of manufacturing uh, to China, and to uh, Mexico, to Indonesia, and so on. Now, the narrative uh, to explain this uh, uh, loss of manufacturing given by the Trump administration is that the Chinese are stealing our jobs, and the Mexicans are stealing our jobs, and creating this kind of uh, Chinese uh, xenophobia and xenophobia to Mexicans and so on. But really, that's not the truth at all. That is not the narrative. It is corporate America in the pursuit of the bottom line has brought uh, US manufacturing to China and has brought GM to uh, Mexico, where there's more now uh, more, more uh, employment for GM in Mexico than there is in the United States. So we're in pursuit of profit. But the narratives by uh, Trump, and I think he, he really uh, exemplifies uh, white supremacy at its worst and racism and anti-Semitism and all xenophobia at its worst. But he, he does articulate exactly the false narrative, which is, uh, which is uh, accentuating xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism. And folks, that is going to grow until we challenge capitalism. Capitalism is the root, in my estimation, of uh, uh, the material root. If, if, if we want to look at it from a materialistic, uh, a, a perspective. That's the root of this and we have to be aware of that that uh, capitalism is the, prob is the basic problem and I hope that's not kind of simplifying it and uh, dismissing a lot of things. A couple of positive things I'd like to bring up that have been recent trends. Yesterday afternoon on my computer I watched a political rally in New York City, huge rally, uh, for the most popular politician in the United States, 
the first Jewish candidate for president who has had a chance to be elected president, where he was being endorsed by a 30-year-old Puerto Rican woman who is the most popular member of the United States House of Representatives. Both of them, by the way, openly call themselves socialists. So um, that's kind of a reason for optimism. I haven't seen that before. Um, none of us have seen that before. Um, so there's some good things going on in the last few years in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. And I think it's interesting and encouraging that there's been a growing awareness in this country, which was not there before, of the injustices perpetrated by the State of Israel. And I'm particularly happy to see the growing number of young Jews who were involved in groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, um, who are committed to justice in the land that is called by different people, Palestine and Israel, um, between the people that live there um, and the people that were expelled from there. Um, and I think that's a very positive development. And it's, it's, I'm very encouraged when I see young Arab Americans and young American Jews working together on this issue. So that's something I find very positive and hopeful. Uh, the other thing I find positive and hopeful is that something that Amer African Americans have known about forever, uh, in the last five years or so, white people have started to find out that the police are racist as hell. <laughs> the criminal justice system is anything but just. Um, and the, it's, it's rotten to the core. And um, people are more aware of it, people are outraged. We had mass demonstrations, mostly by young white people, over the murder by a cop of uh, Antoine Rose. And um, in this year's election, I'm going to do a little plug here for something I'm working on. I've, I volunteered for what I think is the most important local election this year, which is our opportunity to elect someone who is a criminal justice reformer as our district attorney and get rid of a corrupt, incompetent, and frankly racist district attorney, Stephen Zapala. And um, I'm just going to make a little pitch here. I've got a sign-up sheet here. We, need, we, we, have an, we have an obstacle to overcome. Lisa Middleman's running as an independent. There's a very entrenched habit among Pittsburghers and Allegheny County residents to go in to vote and just do it the easy way. Vote the straight, push the straight party button. And when you do that, you're not giving a vote to Lisa Middleman. So we need volunteers next weekend to do canvassing, and especially we need volunteers on election day to be in every polling place in this county to remind people that we have an opportunity to change the criminal justice system, but to do that, you better not push the straight party button. You better vote for Lisa Millman. So those of you who are interested would like to sign up, see me afterwards. I've also got yard signs in my trunk. Thank you. So, and several commemorations uh, or discussions about the 1919 steel strike and uh, at the Pennsylvania <coughs> Historical Association two nights ago, uh, that was the, the subject that I, had, I spoke of. What happened in 19 was a very cynical uh, action by the corporate powers in the United States Steel and other companies here to introduce fairly massively numbers of black uh, strike breakers, all of whom were acting absolutely rationally. They, as uh, Joe Trotter in his latest book shows, the black community was constantly pushing for any crack, any hole, any way to advance the, their interests of their community and get decent employment. So when they had this shot at getting a job here, there was no question. The unions were primarily close to them. This was an AFL uh, situation, so they were acting rationally. The poor hunkies, the Slavic workers, who were they were pitted against, had the same aspirations, exactly the same aspirations for community, for family, for a decent job. But they were being used after having contributed to the war effort, we're now foreigners, we're now immigrants, we're now something lower and worse. And the people who are responsible, obviously the people who divide, divide us and preach hatred. And we got somebody coming Wednesday who's the great divider, the great preacher of hatred, and I hope thousands of people you know, we kicked two presidents out of this, this city. Andrew Johnson in 1866 and Ronald Reagan in 1982. It's time for a third.
my own potato. I'm still probably 50, 60 percent black and you know, white, but I don't know about anybody else. I never had any problems in my community. I don't know what to be racist. Because we lived together, we went to school together, and we played together. Now, there's racism everywhere, we know that. But I mean, as a whole community, still in town, we all work together, you know. Uh, and all my white friends who know me on the mirror of a black town probably say, how can you stay there? What the hell? I was born and raised here. These are my friends. I probably couldn't have won without the black community back then. And there's nobody in this town who would take my back and keep me safe. And so, you know, I have nothing bad to say except that I love my town. I and mean, I don't believe we are racist. There's a lot of racists in the white community. You go all the way back to churches. You had a Polish church, Slovak church, Irish church, uh, Hungarian church. They're all white. They wouldn't go to church together. That's why I had 14 churches in Hungary. <laughs> and, and they still don't like each other. So they don't like the Hungarians, Hungarian, and the Irish had their own church. And I can tell you back in 19, I am Syrian by the way, so it's my country that they're, they're fighting with. Wow. And what can I say? Uh, back in 1970s, I adopted a Palestinian child. I was, I was president of the uh, Orthodox, National Orthodox Youth Organization and it came out that we could adopt. And I adopted a young man by the name of Manir for five years. And I got a letter every year from the, uh, uh, they call it the, not the Red Cross, they had another name for the Red Cross there. And sent me letters, told me how he was doing every year. And when he turned 12 or 13, they said he was able to get a job and they didn't need my help. But I know in my heart that this young man was killed uh. in the Palestinian wars. And, you know, who are we fighting against? Each other. We're, we're, we're all fighting against humanity. That's right. We're all human beings. And God put us on the earth as human beings, not as white, black, Jewish, Arab. And, and uh, I'm agree with one thing. I don't agree with what you're telling me about my peace. I know my peace. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it's fair to put all peace under one umbrella. I know my peace. And they, and they work in Homestead, and, which is a black community, probably. No mm -hmm. problems. But anyway, I just think as human beings, we just got to work together. I don't care. We're Americans. That's what I am. I'm not Syrian. I'm an American. Syrian is my second. But I'm Orthodox. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Jewish. And I've had communication in my years as mayor with everybody. I've met them all. But, you know, you shake their hand and you hug them, and that's all you do, and that's all you should do. It shouldn't be, you know, I don't know what else to say. So I'm just glad to be an American, and I hope there's peace in the world. And I hope we get rid of what's in there. <laughs> because, you know, I, I voted Republican. I voted Republican, just as democratic as I am. But you got to vote for what's, what's killing this country in the world. I mean, this man is dividing everybody. And it's so sad that that happens. So thank you. Thank you. I also find that it's hard to get reliable information or any kind of insight into Antifa, the explicitly anti-fascist movement. So I'd be interested if anyone could just help me out. So quick. Um, I grew up in a, in a basically wealthy Protestant uh, family outside Philadelphia, what's known as the main line, somewhat like your Swigley's and your Fox channels. And I had parents who I thought were treated people with respect and were kind, but they were part of a society and sent me to a prep school that was just through and through, you know, racist in its sort of foundations, anti-Semitic, even though they had a sort of percentage of Jewish students. Went to a university, Princeton, which had a which was the uh, Duke of the North, and uh, put a 
came postered my window when I was just becoming a progressive, and it was broken by the time I got home after the football game. It was, that's the way people were then. And I think we keep finding over and over again that the attitudes that we're talking about, although they are based, there's a lot of fear, there's some deep psychology and issues of loss in the community we need to always be working on, that these ideas are perpetrated by people with wealth and with existing power. And I just ran across a book in the co-op that lays out this whole history of the right-wing sort of strategy coming out of very racist, very anti-Semitic thinking, but, but very capitalist and very you know, wealth-oriented and how it's developed into what we have now. And to me, Trump is just a distractor in chief. Like, he's dividing us. But in a weird way, half the people that are sort of fighting with each other probably have more common interests. And we have to keep our eyes on that economic issue in a bigger, bigger uh, picture. And the other thing on philanthropy, remember, we are us. I mean, we're, we are philanthropists ourselves. We have a foundation called the you know, Three Rivers Community Foundation, which really we can make our own, which I think is always ready to try to kind of build unity between communities. And the other thing we could do as many of us are white or privileged or you know, activists who've had positions is to raise up the young people and people of color and people who aren't like us uh, who are coming up and raise them up and you know, support them and back off. And for that reason, I'd like to invite the young people, if any of you have a comment or a reaction or a question, and I'm not putting you on the spot, I'm just saying it's an invitation. But I think it's valuable because we get to see what these conversations are like outside of the classroom. And we do a lot of these kind of conversations at our college. Um, but it's very, again, valuable to see it out in the open. And whatever has happened or been said, it's cool that we get to see it in the real world. Um, but what I will say is, uh, being a person of color, I hear when we talk about fear, that I'm like, okay, I read Marianne Williamson's book about um, a return to love, which talks about fear a lot, um, which is something that's been said. But um, it's been hard for me to sit back and listen when we talk about things such as we've done a lot of good things and we've had a lot of good ground. Um, because it, it, it takes kind of listening to what other people that aren't talking are thinking and what's going on with them. So part of the reason why I decided to take the mic was because I've been over here reacting to everything that's been said. But you know, it's like y'all don't actually know what I'm thinking and what we can do better unless I actually bring it to you. Um, but so on that note, I just say that um, when I talk to all my, my white friends and my white male friends and we talk about our, the ways that we go about things, I wear a suit every day of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't take off a tie. Mm -hmm. I don't take off a tie. <laughs> really? Yes. Um, so, but and I, I raised this question to my friend who always wears jeans and a t-shirt and I said, do you think the things that I get done being charismatic and cute and you know waking up early, do you think the things that I get done, I could get done if I wore a t-shirt and jeans every day? To that he says no. Um, and this is also something that I have to ask myself when I think about my twin brother who is shorter than me and you know is not as well spoken or charismatic. He's cute, you know, but he's not me and I was always the star football player or whatever. And so I have to look into what his life experiences were about when I start comparing our lives and saying, oh, well, where we grew up was a great place. Well, it was good for me because, you know, I was the star quarterback, right? Um, and so it just takes us to look into what other people are living through before we can say, this is a great environment or a great nation or a great history that we've made. Thank you. Been left out of this discussion of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> And, and the uh, collateral issues that we talked about. And that is the BDS movement. Um, the BDS movement is boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, called by uh, dozens and dozens of Palestinian organiz civil organizations back in 2005 um, to boycott Israel uh, until it uh, uh, ends the occupation until it gives equal rights to the Palestinian citizens of Israel 
and until the wall comes down and the displaced and exiled Palestinian refugees are able to return to their homeland. Um, the BDS movement is uh, the last gasp for Palestinians in a nonviolent way to resist the oppression in Israel. The problem is, it's been granted as anti-Semitic across the board. Uh, not only by Israel, who has spent billions of dollars in a propaganda campaign to demonize the BDS movement, but by, and not only by the Jewish community in the United States, which has done the same thing, but by our representatives in Congress and in state legislatures, which are uh, creating a concerted movement to criminalize support for the BDS movement on college campuses, within companies that support and have investments in Israel. It is now being criminalized to take issue with uh, these companies or these universities. Just as in Israel, you can go to prison for two years if you walk down the street with a BDS sign. So, we need to see that the nonviolent movement for peace and justice in Israel is being demonized and criminalized and charged with anti-Semitism by communities in this country who are preaching and in many ways in good faith struggling against anti-Semitism and yet charging millions, literally millions of people around the globe with being anti-Semitic for attempting to realize a peaceful solution in the Middle East. I mean, we need to look at that, and we need, as you were saying, we need to call that out. Thank you. Thank you all. I have a few closing comments. Um, I just, uh, many of you know, I grew up in Chile, in Santiago, Chile, and was, uh, in, you know, when the coup happened in 73, I was not there, and I had experienced as a child that that was a, a a democratic country. I grew up in a democratic country of Chile, and it suddenly became one of the worst right-wing environments, you know, in our in, in our history, especially in our in our hemisphere's history. And I think that that switch that Carl referred to, that flip, that we are in the flip. It's hard to know when you're in the flip when, when fascism is upon us, but it. It happened to me in my life once, and I believe it's happening now. And I just wanted to say that that um, I grew up, my mother was raised Jewish, my father was raised Catholic, so I, I'm, I'm one that passes. And I, um, I, I don't pass as anything but white, but I hear, therefore, a lot of comments that are about anti-Semitism. I work for the United Steelworkers, I deal with a lot of members from all over the country, and we went to the, see the the murals at Max Ovanka's murals a couple of weeks ago with a group from, and the guy from Texas was really struck by the fact that Maxo had married a Jew. That was the one thing, if you've seen the murals, that's not what's going to come, I don't think, for us. The most important aspect of those murals was that the artist married a Jewish woman and he was raised Catholic. But to him, he was like, boy, that would be really rough. So I'm like, it struck me, and I, you know, we, we pass. We don't think about those things happening all the time, but there is, there is a lot in this conversation that's still out there. And, um, okay, that's my, my little comment. I'll pass it on to you. I'm going to uh, end by picking up on the, something that John Hare uh, said when he uh, pointed out uh, that anti-Semitism and racism are not identical and do have slightly different uh, histories. Uh, for, uh, for, for today's presentation, I was wrestling with the uh, uh, same, exactly the same uh, issue and take, uh, to the exactly the same starting point as uh, John's. And here's what I uh, came up uh, with. Okay. 
for both uh, in, in both discourses, anti-Semitism and racism, it starts with you people cannot be citizens of our country. You cannot enjoy the same rights. What do you people really want? You cannot live among us. You cannot live. That's the common ground that we stand on. And that's why an injury to one is an injury to everyone. And that's frisky to say. But the second final thing I want to say is to end on a, 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 a note that is just a little bit less ponderous and heavy uh, than so much of the things we've been talking about today, he, uh, badly as they need to be uh, said. It's going to take the form of a Jewish joke, whose uh, providence I uh, uh, just uh, don't know because I uh, learned it as a kid uh, many, many years ago. Here's how it goes. In the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Waterloo, one of Napoleon Bonaparte's greatest triumphs of all, he uh, went round to the barracks of the Foreign Legion and said, Men, you were great. You fought wonderfully. Tell me what you want. I am a Polish patriot. Restore the independence of Poland, cried a Pole. It shall be done, said Napoleon. I'm a brewer. Give me the means of production. Give me a brewery, said a German brewer. Shall be done, said Napoleon. I'm a poor peasant. Give me land, said a poor peasant. No problem, said Napoleon. And you, said Napoleon, turning to a Jew, what would you like? Well, sir, if it please your majesty, I would like a nice schmaltz herring. <coughs> That's not the end of the joke. Okay, later that night in the barracks, oh yeah, so the um, boy knows it. Gee, that's a strange one on. Hey, but what, 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 you want a herring? You get a herring. Turns on his heel, leaves. Later that evening, the uh, Jews' uh, comrades fell upon him. How dare you insult the emperor like that? The hell got into you. Listen, said the uh, Jew. You're, you people are the dreamers. I'm the realist. You want the independence of the, your country? You want the means of production? You want land? Things you're going to get from the emperor? No way. You're never going to get those. Me? I'm a realist. If I ask Harry, maybe I'll get one. <laughs> First, uh, following up on what Mayor Betty was talking about, uh, my mother just passed in March. She was 104 years old. Uh, her family grew up in Homestead on 2nd Avenue before the mill was built down there. Her, the Urban League had some workers that they would send to Virginia to get black workers to come up and work in the mill here. And her, her father, my grandfather, was one of the first people to come up and, and his oldest son, they came first and then they sent for the rest of the family. But they lived on 2nd Avenue down here. Um, and there were very, there was always various nationalities here in Homestead. Uh, it's just recently that it's become predominantly African or African American, but there have always been black people in Homestead from way back. Uh, my grandfather was one of the lieutenants in the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. They had a branch and a hall here in Homestead. My mother graduated from Homestead High School. Um, and I had the opportunity to work in a 100-inch mill many, many years later. I was, only, I was only in there 79, 80, two years. I was a young person. I didn't have no time. I got bumped around all the places. Um, yeah, but, but the whole history of Homestead and the, the relations between different nationalities was important. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, though, the brother talked about groups back there. And it's important to work with groups. Like, I grew up in the Hill District, and in the Hill District, that was the main Jewish community in the early 1900s, the main black community. It was also where the Polish people came first, uh, Germans came first, uh, people from Syria, people from Lebanon. The, the Hill District was like the first stop for a lot of families, particularly in the later 1900s, like in the, early, the, the first half of the 1900s. And what they had back then were the settlement house workers who were like social workers, who one of the main thing, parts of their job was intergroup relations and trying to help the various groups in the neighborhood kind of get along. And that's an important area of work that we need to figure out how to revive in the more current uh, times that we're living in. But I think 
the thing about groups and how we, we, we group up and we live in all kinds of groups, not just nationality groups, and how we get those groups to be able to work together and form larger and larger coalitions for positive progress is very important. The last thing I want to mention is the root cause of many of our problems, not necessarily hatred and all the racist problems, but many of our problems, is racialized capitalism. Not just capitalism, and not just racism, but racialized capitalism. There's a founding myth that we carry with us about this country, that the revolution in 1776 was for all these noble things, there's, there's a book put out by Gerald Horn called The Counter-Revolution of 1776. And it focuses on the reason for the fight around 1776 and the victory was to preserve slavery. And we really have to understand that that's the basis for the foundational myth for this country was the preservation of slavery because Britain was outlawing slavery but the South wanted to keep it going longer, and that's what the real fight was about, even though that's not, we don't, we're not taught that in school. We don't learn that. Uh, and if you don't seek it out, you really can't figure it out. But racialized capitalism is really the uh, founding uh, mythology, but it's also the current system that we live on. So a lot of these racial otherings that we find are, in, are an integral part of racialized capitalism. And even if we get rid of capitalism, though, that doesn't mean we got rid of racism. Like if we change to socialism or whatever, whatever the new thing we're gonna call it, um, that doesn't mean that this, this, this intolerance and other kinds of things go away. It's gonna be a constant struggle. Racism was here before capitalism. It'll be here after capitalism. We're gonna to have to continue to fight about it. But I think that group thing has something to do with the solution. We gotta figure out how to do that better. How groups can start to work together and move together in a better way. But the, the ultimate aim of our struggles has to be human development. Thank you.